of filmmaking for, as such. Um, let's begin by talking about the two films, and I was just thinking maybe it makes more sense to start with Boy Eating the Bird's Food, since um, probably most of you just came directly from the screening, um, which sort of reverses my original order. Um, and I would like to begin by asking some, for someone who's familiar with filmmaking, it might be obvious, but, um, and reading even if one doesn't speak um, uh, Greek, um, looking at the credits that it was a shoestring budget production, a small production. Um, that's always sort of an economical claim, but I was very curious about the way you worked with your main actor, who was awarded um, several prizes. I forgot the, there were many more awards at the, never mind, at the Hellenic Film Academy Awards for your, for your film. Um, but um, how did that sort of triangle between camera, your main actor, and you work? And what did your team consist of? Uh, well, first I have to say that it was something that was born in my mind, by, but I have already seen Yanis in a short film, so I'm not sure if the role was born first or I knew him, I have seen him. So it, it was a strong model in my mind and I have I had the need... No. I, want, I wanted to, to shoot not Yanis but what he created in my mind. Uh, I don't know if I would have made the film if it was not for him. It was not just that I started to to search for the casting, to search for actors. Uh, it was like specific. Um, well, I I wrote the first draft of the film and I start discussed with Yanis the whole theme and actually uh, the, the bird of the idea was emerged from our first discussions. So we worked closely for one, two months, uh, reading together the different uh, drafts of the screenplay. And then I start to hold the camera. And first, I, I hadn't, hadn't decided to shoot myself the film. But then I, I understood that it was an extra motive for me to, to do the film, to create a certain choreography between me and, and, and the actor. Uh, so at first we spent like a month or a month and a half uh, with different improvisations uh, in the locations of the, of the film, of the shooting. And gradually we choreographed something like the three-fourth of the film, so most of the, of the movements. And because it, it, it's a screenplay that doesn't have much speech, uh, I felt that it needed something very concrete in the, 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 the body language of the whole thing. That you should... I, I had the, the curiosity to create cer certain routines uh, of this character, the way he would do things as a mirror for us to understand the way of his thinking, because we don't have words, and not only words, but we don't have him um, being with other characters, so we didn't have many mirrors of the character in, in, into other people, so uh, everything should be more reflected in the way he would do the things. Uh, and then we left some things a little bit more free during the, the shooting uh, for kind of uh, ideas, strong ideas. But it was clear that we should be very synchronized. That's the whole idea. Yeah, I mean, if you look at how the camera works, it's, it seems eerie that the camera always, or off, most of the time, knows where the next move goes. Since it's so close by, it's as if it can read the nerves before the actual muscle yeah. move is happening. Um, so, but using the word choreography, I was wondering the way he uses his body to sort of measure out the spaces and the rituals, he, like the, 
the way he, he feeds the bird and takes, puts in fresh water um, and his hands are grabbing the little thing where the, where the food goes. It's highly, it has, um, I was thinking he, he appears to be, it's like dance moves. And therefore the choreography, but he's not a dancer, that's just a No, he's, he's an actor, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Back then he has just uh, graduated from the drama school. Uh, but I mean, he's, uh, he has very good movement. But um, in the theater that I mostly work, it's a kind of my thing, I, I, I like uh, little gestures. I mean, because mainly I do something like actors narrating the story to the audience and uh, using certain gestures that are like, yeah, it's a thing that I really like. People using their hands or seeing them doing things in peculiar ways. I, in the film is also introduced as having a reference to Knut Hamsun's novel, The Hunger or Hunger. And um, since you said it was kind of the meeting Yanis, your main actor, um, that that created the, the role and, and the script. When did that reference come in or...? or? Uh, I'm not sure if I read first the novel, but it was just... I had this idea of a very lonely man and just watching his rituals. And I think then I, 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 I wrote the book. I read the book. <laughs> I read the book. <laughs> I read the book. <laughs> and well, it, it, it's it's different there. I mean, I I, I followed certain uh, subplots with the girl, especially, uh, but mainly it's a different story because it, 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 the, the narrator is the. I would call it internal narrator in the in the book. So the whole book is like his m mad thoughts uh, coming out of uh, hunger. Uh, and I like the book, the idea that he was an artist. In the book, he's a journalist and a, something like a writer. But uh, I like that he that his job, his profession in the book was something not. Uh, handcraft, you know. The, I'd like to sort of join it to Atanasio's film by asking about, you have both very, very specific ways of framing sort of the camera work and very oppositional, yet both, have, or not oppositional, very different. In your case, the, the camera is always very close to the, the body and follows it. It's almost, it's also very attached to the shoulders and looks over the shoulders of the character and, and becomes part of this increasing constraint. And, and like he, he's not just becoming undone and losing his hair and literally sort of becoming unhinged. Um, he's also, like, even though you could say the space opens, but the moment he loses his apartment, it becomes even more constrained. While um, Tospiti is shot in this sort of very uh, differently framed cinema scope, uh, maybe I should repeat for those who didn't see it, it's the story of a fairly rich or wealthy family living in, I think, Marathon in, uh, in Greece, and they have a, oh, it's called a to domestic uh, help, domestic worker, Nadia, who's originally uh, who's, uh, Georgian. Um, and um, it's not clear what the couple, they have a daughter who's 12 maybe, or something like that, um, and they're fairly wealthy, but we don't know how they make their money, and, the, and it seems like they have to relocate to somewhere, I think South Africa, I think. Um, and then it turns out that Nadia, the domestic help, is, um, is diagnosed with a severe illness that she's not told about, but the doctor who diagnoses her is a family friend and it's all informal because they hired her also informally and didn't, she doesn't have health insurance. And then they, um, they despite be, prior to that being declared a family friend and belonging to the family and his, his being let go. And, but she's not, like she's this character who doesn't, revenge isn't her mode of response even though her boyfriend, he gets very angry, angry, but that she doesn't get angry, she, she sort of accepts the situation. 
Um, and it's shot mostly in their house, which is this sort of brutalist modernist architecture. For me, it also reminds me of a white cube situation, and the white cube is repeated in the sort of framing, in the cinema scope of very crisp, clear colors, and the camera is often staying with these spaces while the, the figures enter and exit. So I would like to hear about your sort of, um, because they're very specific about the spatial order you create, if you could talk about these framings. Uh, in my case, I, I would, I think my, what was also interesting to me was uh, the relationship of the figure and the space, and the relationship of uh, landscape to the figure. So it's a, I think it's a bit like painting. I, if I if I could say that actor's film, which I really really like, is um, something like ex abstract express expressionism because it follows the energy of the camera and the character. In my case, it's sort of a bit more like um, constructivism or something like that. That, that kind of uh, talks a lot about relationships of lines and relationships of material and space and figure. Mm -hmm. So, I, in my case, I was I was trying to um, also skew the um, with this aesthetic. I, w I was trying to maybe understand the aesthetic of the of the of the inhabitants of this house. Um, they are wealthy educated, tasteful people, and sort of that doubles their um, intentions of harmony in a, maybe in a disturbing way. Um, but also it was a way of eschewing the, the idea of a social drama, because the, the, the theme of the film is something that's inherently um, social, political, but I was trying to find a way of, of going around the, the, um, the naturalistic approach and the idea that there can be a, um, an object of art, a film that can, let's say, change the world or give answers. And uh, that was my way of doing it through the aesthetics. Would you like to follow up on the, the question of framing? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, my two first short, my short films were a little bit more similar than than this approach, uh, and the directors that I used to like, but then starting to work with Yanis, I understood that I want more to... I, it was not clear if I, I wanted... which was the, the point of view, you know? Uh, so, Without conceptualizing, I just let myself to to just film it, and then I understood that I wanted to be really close to him, uh, just and getting many uh, opportunity from opportunities from his energy and the way he moves and the motives of his body. Uh, I, uh, other other times, like following them, and other times going uh, the other way, like down or, or up, and. I, I, it was this vague idea of not being his own uh, point of view, but but neither me uh, like a voyeurist um, following him. I tried something like uh, I can't find the words. It's just a bit very cliche, but something like non-material thing following him. But, I mean, everything becomes like, it, the world around him starts to uh, sort of speak. What? The, the non-material things that start to follow him, both his sort of um, mind coming undone, and the, his, he yeah. explains in his brain losing, but also the objects, everything starts to speak, I find, watching yeah. the film. Both of you... I, 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 I like what you're saying about non-material, because in my film it's all about material. Yeah. 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 It's all about uh, objects in a kind of circular yeah. way. Uh, they become repressive and become more, sometimes even more important than the people themselves. Until the end, people become objects and material that are exchanged. So that was, that's an interesting uh, contrast. In, 
both, I, I was realizing too that both films, I think, span a very short period of time, or am I imagining this was Dos Piti? It's three days, something like that, um, for a boy eating his, the bird's food. Three days. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so, yeah. And the other thing, I mean, in your case, and I would like to ask, talk about melodrama, as the format of melodrama in a second, but in both cases you could say, because the, the characters kind of stay in their same colored clothes, in your case it's very specific, she wears the same dress all through the film, and she be, she's clearly an allegorical, um, she inhabits the space of an allegory, um, which is also typical for the sort of the female sufferance in, in the melodrama. Um, but I was thinking, I was thinking through about the term allegory for various reasons, for its etymological, con what it contains. It contains also the agora, and we'll come back to that, which I thought was, I didn't know. I never, I never knew about this part of the, uh, of the work, but also because, um, because of its close sort of the proximity in sound to um, the agonistic and the agony of this, the sufferings. Um, and I was wondering um, about both of your, their, how you relate to that reading to say that even though they're so different that there's an allegorical, um, to read both your main characters as sort of allegorical. I guess in your case it's in Atanas and it doesn't seem so far-fetched, but I don't know if you relate to that. Uh. I don't know if it was on purpose writing or creating the material, but when you choose not to have a dense plot, uh, I think that it's very difficult not for the audience to perceive the film as not, not an allegory. Um, well, I'm not sure because uh, I tried not to, uh, creating the film, uh, not to have other things in my mind like what does it mean, uh, other than I have I, I, I like filming uh, roles that have a certain idea of purity and of um, something between something which relates to the dignity in this. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why I asked it because I re I remember you know preparing for this I was reading interviews and um, other articles on the on, on your films and in one you are you often quoted with saying I I it had to be this character that I wrote somehow it had to be a woman and an immigrant I don't I don't know the reasons for this and this allegory of the female suffering for me is something that I find very hard to bear for someone as angry as I am. Mm -hmm. And connecting that to the discussions of today and yesterday, and I think I was, you know, talking about the performative presence of the agonistic. That's why I sort of brought it up. This, this question of suffering and agony, and how do you read that politically? Maybe completely far-fetched, um, but I think it's a different approach in saying, yeah, this is social dramas, and they show the the effects of the austerity politics. Um, and For the me, it was more quite clear because I chose the the. The idea of melodrama and the, 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 the genre of melodrama has specific rules. It's usually a woman, and it's usually a home, and it's usually familiar problems, and it's usually injustice, very often sickness. And um, because one of the directors of my most, Douglas Sirkin, he worked very much with uh, the idea of overturning this, this the genre of melodrama, trying to kind of um, connect, tap into this kind of um, energy. and. This is how it all turned out to be uh, allegorical, and um, also the, my disbelief in social genres and social realistic film uh, as such and naturalism um, showed me uh, ways of, of dealing with that, not just in, in, in terms of framing, but also the clothing, the, uh, you know, the idea of skin time, it's always day until there's only one night, there's a lot of artificiality in it. And I like to challenge that, because very often when we see a film, we think it is a film about something. But we forget that the film is something itself, and um, it's it's very bitter when you start talking about formalism, in, in maybe in terms of political context. But formalism is political; it's a political choice. And for us filmmakers, this is the tools we work with. We don't talk only about things; we make things. And uh, the the the, the, um, uh, 
conscious choices of elements like the camera or the clothes or the framing is our vocabulary. That was well said. Um, and I do agree. It has a long tradition. I don't know what's the tradition in the discussion in other contexts, but I know at least for the German this sort of history, this, there were strong oppositions, particularly in the 80s, between the formal and the content. Um, what is political cinema? And it, it's actually part of Hamburg's film history. I know there were vicious debates around this. Um, and in some ways, I do think um, that question of what is, so what is the place of art in this sort of political context? Is it art that is about? Is it the social plastic? Is it the intervention? Um, and I do think there's always this element that you just pointed out nicely that is, has to do with the aesthetic experience and something to imagine otherwise, and not just, as I said, in, as by way of introduction, not just the illustration of argument. Um, maybe I'll take it from there to sort of the larger frame. Um, and one of the, I mean, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but there, in recent years, for a couple of years now, there's been talk about the so-called New Greek Cinema, which for some odd reasons has been called the weird wave, I think. I don't know who coined it, I couldn't find out, but most prominently this is connected to two films, only two films. Uh, Yorgos Lantim, uh, Lantimos' Dogtooth from 2009 and Athena Tsangari's Atomberg from 2010. Um, and I would like to start by discussion what we make, do we make with, of such national cinema constructs. And I ask this for several reasons. And one is the critique that was also uttered in various ways, particularly yesterday at the opening panel of current nationalism in relation to German media and um, you know, with puzzlement of what it actually means that the European Union was meant to counter nationalist politics and now nationalism is back with full throttle. Um, and the second reason is cinema specific. In cinema studies, um, the concept of, of placing films in a national context is something that was introduced after the First World War and seems to be a very sticky concept despite efforts in past years um, to particularly introduce the concept of world cinema in opposition to national cinematographies. Um, and I was wondering what relevance does such labeling have for your film work and how, rather how do you relate to such interpolation given the very transnationalism of your films that, that your films embody, I would say. And the second, um, well, yeah. And of course this becomes even more complex since Athanasius is a you know, living in Germany and working in Germany, and this, I forgot to say, Stospiti is a great German co-production, and we'll talk about production also in a second, um, uh, and knowing the German cinema context very well, you're continuously haunted by this question, are you a German or a Greek filmmaker, and the struggle to avoid such labelings or being coined uh, the migratory subject who makes films or other such movements. So I was wondering how you relate to that. Does it has, have any significance? It could be a very short question and answer in this case, but since it is such a strong reading, and I guess you've been invited in that context probably also, um, how do you relate to that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I can speak. As a spectator, I do like uh, national cinematographies uh, in, in, in a way that I think that people... I'm very curious about people talking about their own societies. I, 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 I'm very curious, it's time Mike Lee has a new film to watch his approach of, uh, of English society, of uh, Dardenne's or... Uh, even Sorrentino's, which is his Italian films and his international films. So I think that the cinema has this power to, in a way, give the image that someone has in his mind and his struggle with his national identity. Uh, but it, it, maybe it's personal because I use theater mostly for something more international language in my mind. Even even though I, I like doing theater in Greek because I like I like the language and I I, I, I do I, I very like uh, I like to be expressed. I, I I tend to 
to use more international, I mean, uh, theatrical language. So, for me, film is a way to form or to, to just to think about what's Greek to me, you know? It, it's, it's a way to, to understand if I want to have a, a certain role in this society. And because also film is, um, is a business, you know, and it, it's a way you can make a statement in the way you, 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 you want business to be made, you know, because it, it's, it's something expensive, it's, it's something like a corporation, it's something like, um, in my mind you can do it in a bad way or a good way, you know? Um, you can do it in a way that uh, um, create something like uh, I'm referring to the, the, this idea of, of, a, of a teamwork because normally in, in cinema we have this idea of the auteur of the one and only the mind you can see one's own dream and I'm very curious in more uh, team creative uh, process. When you can see a film and you can understand that it, it's, it was influenced by, by, by more people and the way it was made. That will be actually the next question because I... I, I did yeah. not. Yeah, that's why I oh. said we'll pick this up in a second. Okay. Um, I, 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 I tried to, to avoid uh, this binary kind of thinking because I've been troubled many times. Having said that, um, there is something inherently different um, in ways of telling stories. If we go back to Asian storytelling and European storytelling, for example, in narratives, there is there's something very different. We have uh, uh, Asian um, cinema that is based on uh, Asian tradition of, of narratives, which is more like a, like a net, like a web, where you don't follow the, um, the Western way of, of the Aristotelian way of telling a story. Um, so there might be something true in that. I try not to think in national cinemas. I, for me, it's very difficult also, like you said, to answer the question because I come and I've lived in both cultures and I come from Greece. I've left 27 years ago and I've been here for 25. So um, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe in, in thinking uh, in national in, in national cinema. And so the, the, the idea of the Greek weird Film only uh, only comes close to me as in, the, in moments when I have to define myself. When I have to say no, I don't belong there, or I don't want to be measured to those standards. But that's it. Yeah, the uh, German film scholar Vincent Sieliger has uh, written a paper that he titled "Genius in Genius." I think, uh, "What do we know when we know where something is?" That we borrowed as a curatorial headline to use a lot at the Berlin Film Festival for something. Um, and I, I always think this question is valid to be asked, but as that question, what do we know if we know where something is? This? So um, that does mean there is, of course, a specific context in which you produce, but it doesn't mean that that is the full knowledge of something, uh, of the reception of a film. I mean, the idea of, of identity in general yeah. is so complex that I cannot say I'm Greek without saying I'm this and that and that and that as well. So. Uh, to me, it makes absolutely no sense to define myself in terms of a national identity because I'm so much other stuff as well. I'm as German as Greek. That's it. But when it comes to production, and this is now in 2013 here in Hamburg, there was, I think it's discontinued, but the so called Griechische Filmtag, the Greek film days, um, and then there was a, um, an article in the daily newspaper, the Tats, that said, um, read the fact that the most recent film showed in 2013 was from 2010 as a sign of the crisis, sort of insinuating that there weren't any other films, which of course isn't true. Yet um, it's true that the funding, and I think the main film funding was in, in, in Greece, went through the Greek Film Center, right? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And that um, in 2011, indeed only 20 only, but 20 feature films were produced, 
I don't have any numbers for the years since, but I, I've read somewhere that they haven't dispersed any funding since 2009. So indeed, of course, the question, where does the money come from for making film? And you, quite aptly, even if it's a shoestring budget, making film is always a team, no matter how small, and it does cost quite a lot of money. And the way film funding works is that it is also, in most cases, addressed as sort of an economic factor. So if you get national film funding, you're expected to also shoot in those countries. And for, an, for a European co-production, you still have to have 20%, I think, Greek money if you apply for funding from outside. 40. 40. I think. I'm yeah, depending on, I guess, the setup. I'm not that familiar. but. Um, what what's your experience now? You made your film. I think you shot in 2011. I guess you made the film in 2011, and then it was released in 2012. But what's the context? Um, and I don't think talking about money is the sole you know the sole question of how can you make films. But it is a valid question, and um, um, and I do th and it's. And I know there's sort of in the context, so the, I forgot to mention the awards you got from the Hellenic um, Film, what was it, Hellenic Academy Awards that was, fun, that was founded in 2009 as well by, film, by filmmakers. Um, and they did address um, problems, sort of structural uh, deficiency of the Greek Film Center and, um, and the sort of um, were addressing cronyism and, and such issues in terms of funding. Um, and tr we're trying to introduce a new pass for a new film funding law. So I don't know how familiar you are with this or how much that matters for you. Of course it matters. Back then in 2011 uh, that I worked on the film, the film center was closed. Uh, so it was not any chance to, to wait for that. So knowing that, I tried to write something really, really, really cheap uh, that could be made with a minimum uh, crew, and and trying not to uh, oblige people work too much without being paid. So I just try to to have only 20, 20 days of uh, shooting, and then we, we created a system that <coughs> we divided the the film into shares. So we tried every every uh, amount that came to the film of a price or something could be divided in the people. But after that experience, I, I wouldn't do that again. I mean, I, I have done it in theater two or three times with very small productions, but uh, for me, it's so much difficult. Again, it's, not, it's, ethical, it's an ethical issue, but also is, is a professional issue, because <clears throat> if you want to do your work properly, uh, you cannot uh, demand devotion for people that do other works to earn the money. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, for me, if I cannot find money for a new film, I will not do it. I just write a book, you know? Uh, it's not a question. It's, I would change uh, an art form, you know? Uh, for me, it's not an option, again, not to pay people. Or, I'm referring to myself too, because when I work a film or a, or a, or a theater play, uh, I consider myself as I'm working on that, uh, as a director, or, you know what I mean. Uh, so I want to be paid from, from that. It's, it's, I, I want to, to, to assume that as a profession. I am diametrically opposed. I, I would do anything to make a film. I'm a film whore. I would, um, I've made four films, two of them uh, I made myself. Uh, I've worked in this business for 20 years. I still can't survive from my filmmaking I teach. And I've done all kinds of other works to do that. And because maybe because I come from a fine art tradition where you do anything you can to make a painting or a photograph, of, I would do anything to, to to make the film, and because I don't necessarily see myself, I agree that it's a it's a group thing, but I don't see myself necessarily as the head of the group. So if I don't get paid and then nobody gets paid, then it's fine. If I get paid a little and everybody gets paid a little, it's fine. Because I think, um, talking about the crisis and the cockroaches, I think we've, we've all learned to survive um, doing our art, and it's so important, at least for me, to do it under any conditions. So um, I think I would, 
I'm not very I'm not very interested in making a habit out of it. And we for this film we had very little funding. We had 150,000, which for German international production is very very little money. But I know that for a Greek production, for example, or for any kind of other country, is a lot of money. But um, I, I think I would do anything it takes to make it to do it again. I don't, The problem is that it creates a very bad exam example for the business. It does, you know, it mean, does, and I usually yeah. never say how much money I made this film with because people say, don't say it because then they will say, oh, we can do it with 150,000. Yeah, yeah. Of course, but then on the other hand, you have issues of, you know, you want to say something, you want to go and do your work, so... Yeah, I can understand it, yeah. <laughs> I, the, 2013, there was also a fairly large conference in Greek cinema in London and I read all the abstracts and, and one of them was addressing this question of funding but it wasn't just the question of production but also the question of distribution and um, in both of your cases I know um, uh, Stosviti it was taken up in distribution by the Arsenal the institution that I worked with in Berlin but um, bird eating, um, uh, bird eating this boy's food, boy eating <laughs> the bird's food, um, I think mainly it was shown in festivals and special screenings. I don't know if you have a cinematic release, had a cinematic release. Not because a small release in France and Spain. Yeah, yes. but it's something that, in one of the papers I was very interested in because it wasn't just at, asking the question of production money, but also how do these films then get into the world? And the reason why I'm asking this is because both of you pointed out that filmmaking is a collective effort. And I would like to know, since you both have, even though you said, well, theater was just like, that's a, it sticks in the... Okay, well, that's twice as, you know, I, it still counts. So both have, as artistic practice, as opposed to other, let's say, fine art practices, are really, do have a connection to the collective. Not only in terms of their making, they have to be sort of a collective effort. I think Siegfried Kakao wrote about that also, but it's something that gets sort of dissimulated by talking about auteur cinema, as if this one person makes this film and then it's there. Um, but also because it is, a, it is, even in the change, in the way cinema has changed, it's a collective viewing experience. And I do think, even though that was the big promise of the sort of the political promise of the cinema in the 20th century, that somehow this was both why people were scared of cinema, it would somehow seduce the masses into doing things they were not supposed to do. We all know that that's not how it works, yet even in its... Yes, unfortunately. But it does refer to sort of a... Um, uh, its reception always addresses, and even if it's digital, you know, if people watch it online, um, we know that there's a whole body of communication around that, that creates a sort of collectivity. Um, and I was wondering how taking that, um, you know, I have to follow up my interest in that, but since you both worked in theatre, what's the difference? Now, theatre, I think, is also um, has to do with, because it, it has to be with the audience, um, um, but it has a different time notion and it's more fixed to a certain space. I was wondering how, what difference is there in your theatre work and, and your cinema and your filmmaking work? Or if that is actually an appeal also, the film? I'll answer first because it's a very short answer because I haven't okay. done a lot of theatre. I've done it twice. Once was with just one person. It was a homeless um, artist who used to work for the Volksbühne, for the uh, Ratten, for the Rats. And that was as a student. And the second time was with two people from the Volksbühne, which were part of the ensemble. And in the second case, uh, it was a very unpleasant experience. Uh, that I'm not very interested in, in repeating again because um, I found the dynamic of a theater family, a theater ensemble, for, for me very incestuous. I found that uh, I was not used to that kind of uh, um, division of power, let's say. That was not collective at all for me. I was hired from the theater to do this piece. Then you have the ensemble of the artists, of the, of the actors that know that they're there, whatever you do. And they can come to the rehearsal, not come to the rehearsal, do this or that, change, their, change the piece however they want to do it. So for me it was not like in the cinema, at least um, kind of uh, uh, a good exchange. So that was not a collective experience for me. But maybe you have another. Yeah, that, that's what I like in theater. That, yeah, for me it's a the challenge of my control freakness, you know, because whatever you, 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 you may do during the performance, 
the audience is such a such a big thing that will change everything. Uh, and also, well, for me, theater mostly is when I will want to be very influenced by something external. Uh, either it will be the text that I would go into the, the thought of someone that I really, really like, like a good writer, you know, and and then be influenced by all these people that you have to live together like a family, and it's so much different. Uh, well, the other one is like for, like a capitalist for me experience a capitalist. Uh, I mean, what in terms of production, because you have to be there and just uh, take the moment and, and like steal the moment. In, uh, in filmmaking. In filmmaking. filmmaking is a capitalist experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 for me. Yeah. Why is theater different? <laughs> because theater, I mean, it's like uh, something really for me, old-fashioned and really like a big, big families in front of others and like just sharing. Um, it's just a very strict uh, idea in my mind. <laughs> and one, and the, other, the other one is that you, you running through the world and just trying to steal something really amazing and start something really like strong and just show it. I, don't know. I think it has to do with the approach. I think it has to do with how you make it.